And I'm not going to ask you to stop driving. I mean, that's kind of silly. In this kind, especially in this country, but even in China, we love our cars. Um, uh, you know, five years ago there was this, uh, this this conference at Harvard, and one of the researchers was reporting back. They did a random survey, and they asked people, "What do you think is freedom? What class? You know, what in your mind defines freedom?" And I would I would have said, "I don't know, lights." You know, what was the number one? Cars. People love their cars. So I'm not going to ask you to stop driving your cars, but there are many things you can do. For example, one third of the trips that we take every year is for less than one mile long. I mean, we can combine our trips. We can, th we can be a little bit more thoughtful and combine our trips. Many more things you can do. Can I finish? Can I put us closing? He's very eager to, to let me finish. You can, so so um, you can check your tires monthly. Uh, you can change the bulb. Uh, you can save, you know, if, if you go from incandescent light to compact fluorescent lights, you can save 60 to 70 percent uh, of energy. Uh, you can shut down all your videos and TVs and so forth. Uh, so let me let me let me just close. Uh, what I want to say um, ab about uh, climate change is that um, there is a moral dimension of climate change. You heard earlier, it, it's not really the I impact on a global sense, but it's the imp this this is the, what I call the intergeneration impact. The actions that we're taking today affect. Uh, the future of our children and grandchildren, and climate change affects the poorest across the planet. So it is a moral um, uh, issue. And I'm going to close with a wonderful uh, saying from Patrick Bartholomew. Uh, he said a few years ago in Rome, it's not too late. God's word has incredible healing powers within a single generation. We could steer the earth toward our children's future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Morgan. That was fascinating. Um, we have uh, Father uh, Athanasios Shaw uh, to, f to finish up. Is he really? F Father Doctor. Um, uh, all the way from Portland, right? Or to be from Tennessee. Oh. Thanks. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. So I'm going to talk today about um, going out into the wilderness, because that is a passion of mine. That is a passion of mine, going out into the wilderness. So there is a long tradition in the church of going out into the wilderness and uh, seeking God. It's been established in our church. It's embedded in our church, church tradition. St. Jer Jerome said in the fourth century that the desert fathers and mothers went out into the wilderness to, to flee the corruption of the cities, to wage war against the passions, and to encounter the holy. The wilderness has long been an arena for spiritual struggle, for spiritual growth, for practicing spiritual, spiritual life. It has been in the past, and the wilderness is an arena today that offers the same accessibility for spiritual growth as it has in the past. There's an orthodox program called Christ in the Wilderness that offers the opportunity to go out into the wilderness in a group setting and to put very simple, effective, and very clear methods of spiritual practice into your, into your life. The program works very well for clergy. It works for parish members and throughout the 25 years or so that Christ in the Wilderness has been uh, holding uh, events, uh, many non-Orthodox people have attended also. Oftentimes, most times from my experience, what has happened is that participants who go to Christ in the Wilderness events get very much in touch with their spiritual struggles and with their spiritual striving. They get in touch 
in a way that is very simple, clear, and effective. The basic parts of the program are learning spiritual lessons through nature. The second part is struggling with the passions and acquiring the virtues. The third part is opening up and experiencing the presence of Jesus Christ in his creation. So we go out into the wilderness because there is a potential to learn spiritual lessons through nature. St. Paul tells us in Romans 1.20 that God reveals himself through creation. St. Paul says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, he, even his eternal Godhead. In our Orthodox theology, everything that God has created, everything in nature, has something to say about God as a divine manifestation of the Logos. Everything in nature has uh, something to teach us about our orthodox way of life. Saint Basil the Great tells us to learn from the ant. I learned that in, the in uh, seminary. <laughs> Saint Basil the Great tells us to learn from the bee in order to become more productive disciples of Christ. The desert fathers and mothers learned valuable spiritual lessons through nature. Saint Anthony the Great in the fourth century, as he lived out in the desert, somebody came to him and asked him, Elder, how do you live in the desert without any books? And Anthony the Great said, whenever I wish to, I read the nature of created things. Jesus Christ our Lord himself taught us many lessons about nature and through nature, nature. He told his disciples, he instructed his disciples to go to consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. Christ himself told his disciples, behold the fowls of the air. And we've heard many other things that our Lord used uh, today um, uh, about nature. The Christ in the Wilderness program, in the, in, the, in the Christ in the Wilderness program, Jesus Christ really truly becomes our teacher. If we approach creation as a holy ground, as sacred, expecting to encounter the holy, we as Orthodox Christians very much need to grow in this understanding about creation, that it is holy because we live in a society that thinks and acts very contrary to this, to this understanding of our Orthodox understanding of creation. St. John Chrysostom tells us, from the creation, learn to admire the Lord. He has made this mode of this creation to be our best teacher. We learn, we can also learn through the wilderness lessons concerning our struggles with the passions and acquiring or the acquisition of the virtues. And this is done by engaging in a very simple uh, method that is presented in Christ in the wilderness. Often when we go into an Orthodox church and we are surrounded by the icons of Christ and the Theotokos and all the saints and the angels, oftentimes we are touched by a very deep sense, a very acute sense of our own sins and passions. This is because we're surrounded by holiness. The same thing happens when we go out into the wilderness. We have a sense, we get in touch with those passions that lie within us. This is because nature is a vast icon of Christ. Saint Basil the Great tells us, this marvelous creation 
is the supreme icon of Christian faith, which leads to knowledge of the supreme artisan. St. John Damascene tells us that this whole earth is a living icon of Christ. My experience in Christ in the wilderness is, has helped me to see very much, in a very clear way, that my sins, my passions that manifest in arrogance and anger and judgment of my brother and sister blind me to the holiness that lies within creation. It blinds me to the holiness that lies within myself. It blinds me to the holiness that lies within my brother and sister. Therefore, it is the practice in Orthodox spiritual life to see our passions and to struggle with them by the acquisition or uh, of virtue, of the virtues, or as we sing, as we dance around the uh, baptismal font to put on Christ. In Christ in the wilderness, we take a baby step each day of putting on a virtue, of struggling, of striving to practice one of these five virtue, virtues each day. The virtues of giving thanks to God for all things all the time. The virtue of humility. The virtue of seeing the beauty of the Lord in creation, in each other, in yourself. Be the beauty of the, seeing the beauty of the Lord. The virtue of silence or solitude. And love for creation and love for your neighbor. So each morning, we begin by reading a selection from the scripture from the Holy Fathers and Mothers who speak about these virtues and who speak about the nature of creation that enhances one's accessibility to these virtues. Then we go out and we see what creation has to teach us. For instance, this past spring in the Redwoods in Northern California, there were 12 of us on a, in a uh, Christ in the Wilderness event in the, in the Redwoods of Northern California. And as we went out, we each sat, found a little perch and sat, carrying the virtue of gratitude, of thanksgiving, giving thanks to God for all things. And the idea was to practice that all day. As we sat and watched, and observed, you begin to sense the thanksgiving, the gratitude that nature itself raises up to create the creator all the time. Winter, summer, night and day, storms, sunny weather, in song and in spirit, the birds, the plants raise up a song of gratitude to God all the time. It's hard when you not to feel that you have actually touched the hem of Christ's garment in these experiences in the wilderness. The same goes through for humility, seeing the beauty in one another, love for, love for creation, giving thanks. It's easy to feel and to experience these virtues through creation because they're very accessible. It is not so easy to do this all, it is not as easy to do this in the city because of all the noise and distraction. It is quite easy, quite accessible in the wilderness. The exercise of these virtues can be translated into daily life. Uh, there has been a very strong desire engendered for a follow-up program to exercise these virtues uh, in our daily lives from participants in Christ in the wilderness. And so there's a follow-up program that is being developed that we can follow, take a virtue each month, and really focus on that virtue and practice it in our daily lives in the city. Christ in the wilderness offers an experience based on Orthodox tradition of going out into the wilderness, 
struggling uh, with our passions and experiencing Jesus Christ, drawing closer to Jesus Christ through his creation. Wilderness is a ripe venue for encountering Jesus Christ today. As the desert fathers and mothers have done in the past, we can also uh, benefit by God's beautiful creation and experiencing the lessons that Jesus Christ has to teach us through creation. To conclude, many of our hierarchs are now speaking out and proclaiming that it is very essential to reclaim our right relationship with Jesus Christ through his creation. The late Patriarch Ignatius IV of Antioch in the East has stated, without the contemplation of nature, one never comes to the mystical side of orthodoxy. Christ in the wilderness puts these words into action. It puts our theology into practice, something that we can use in our everyday life. And it's also just a great bunch of fun to be with these people out in the woods. Thank you. Sorry, we don't have any time for questions. So in the interest of time, Father Chris. Thank you to our uh, wonderful panel. We're very grateful for your presentations. I would like to introduce Ann Glenn McCool, who will moderate our next uh, panel. The theme is putting theology into action in the parish. But while the uh, participants are coming forward, I'd like to ask Alex Patico to say a few words. He represents the Orthodox Peace Fellowship. Thank you, Father Chris. Uh, as he said, I represent the Orthodox Peace Fellowship. Our speakers have made it quite clear that uh, it's not too hard to draw the, the line to connect the dots between environment and natural resources on the one hand and human conflict uh, on the other, and unfortunately so many places around the globe. Uh, having spent about half of my professional life working on environmental issues, I'm very pleased that our fellowship was able to make some modest contributions uh, to this conference. So allow me to express my gratitude and congratulations on behalf of all of our OPF members to uh, Fred, Father Chris, Achilles, Father John, Deacon Sergey, and all the other members of the planning committee for this wonderful event. And to the clergy and parishioners of St. Sophia, Efcharisto. And finally, I bring warm greetings from our International Secretary, Jim Forrest, uh, to all of his, his friends here from his home in the Netherlands. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anne has been a, is a founding mem a member of the steering committee of the Orthodox Fellowship of the Transfiguration. She has a strong commitment to our cause. She is also a very active uh, member of the Antiochian Orthodox Archdiocese. She is a trustee of uh, the Board of Directors of St. Vladimir Seminary, as, and she also represents, is among the delegation that represents the uh, Patriarchate of Antioch at the World Council of Churches. We're honored that you're able to join us today. Thank you so much. Thanks. Also, I'd like to ask our participants to please limit your, your remarks to 10 minutes because Please keep in mind that many of us have to catch a plane. We're going to ha we have to leave. The time is short. We apologize that we've gotten so late so far. Thanks, Thanks Father Chris. Um, because the uh, title of this one is uh, Putting Theology into Action in the Parish, I would suggest we put ourselves into action just for one minute. Could we just stand up and stretch for this long, rich day of wonderful uh, information? Thank you, thank you, thank you. I know that I needed that. I've just actually come back from the Assembly of the World Council of Churches, 
that was uh, uh, concluded on Friday in South Korea. Um, and I just would like to let you know, those who have mentioned ecumenical co cooperation in this issue, it, for the World Council of Churches, the um, Integrity of Creation program has been many years standing and, and has drawn from the spiritual and theological riches of uh, the ecumenical patriarchate where uh, his All Holiness is held in very high esteem. So um, we're going to switch around the um, order of our speakers because um, of the lateness of time. One of our speakers needs to get on the road. Uh, and um, so let me uh, quickly introduce Father Constantine Lazarakis. He's the associate pastor at Dormition of the Virgin Mary Greek Orthodox Church in Southampton, New York where they're in the final phase of construction. So um, the sanctuary and ministries uh, complex. Um, Father Constantine completed his Masters of Divinity at Holy Cross and serves as a director at Ionian Village prior to his uh, assignment. I'm sure he'll have a lot to say about incorporating um, green concepts into parish construction. Father? Thank you very much for that warm introduction. Um, I want to say thanks to Father Zorzos and Father Lee for hosting us all, and to um, Fred and Father Chris Avies and everyone who worked to organize. Thank you very much. So we were, uh, um, and thank you to everybody for accommodating me since my flight's coming up. I was very blessed over the last three years, right as I started my full-time work at the Congregation of the Greek Orthodox Church in Southampton, Dormition of the Virgin Mary, that we had just commenced on the construction of a, of a, of a, of a complex of buildings, including our sanctuary, which had been about 10 years in the works prior to construction beginning. So you just see a couple of photos scrolling through of what the people of our congregation and the friends of our congregation have built. Um, as the associate pastor, I was also blessed and very lucky to um, be intimately involved in the execution of the project. From the beginning of the project, um, following the mandate of um, His All Holiness Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, not least of all the mandate of our consciences, we, um, we wanted to make the building as green as possible. And in the early theoretical days, we were talking about LEED certification and everything else. Um, and uh, we didn't quite get to LEED certification. Um, and I like the classical answer to the question is, are you saved? And the response is, um, I was saved, I'm being saved, and I will be saved. And so in response to the question, is your parish green? I like to say, we started to get green, we're getting greener, and we will be green. So we continue to work on that. But <clears throat> what I wanted to talk about today, or what I was asked to talk about today, was um, what considerations did we put into the planning? How did those plans come to fruition or not come to fruition? What were some of those challenges? How did the theology of the church in terms of God as creator inform those decisions? And then what's our vision going forward in terms of um, further development of the green aspects of the facility and the ministries and operations within the building and how they become green as well. So like I said, when we started out, we had a lot of plans for um, a lot of, not even a lot of plans. We had a lot of discussion about what we could do to make the building green. We wanted to do solar. We wanted to do geothermal. We wanted all the appliances to be you know, um, efficient. We wanted to um, incorporate zero scaping, some kind of landscaping that wouldn't require any additional water, irrigation, all indigenous plants, so on and so forth. And for a variety of reasons that I can't get into, all I'm going to say is that construction moves really slow, and then it moves fast and furious. And sometimes you just have to get on and ride, or you're just never going to get it done. Um, so some of those things we weren't able to do. The geothermal ended up being cost prohibitive, and finding the competent engineer at the right time, at the right place, with the right price, precluded us from doing that. Um, the zero scaping, we had a really robust discussion. And um, we wanted to do it in the beginning. 
and we figured out that our kids weren't going to have anywhere to play if we did the zero scaping. And we have a ton of kids in our parish. Um, so there is discussion about possibly in the future zero scaping portions of the facility, but we didn't end up executing that. What we did end up doing, though, and what we're very thankful for and very, very proud of, is if you look at the roof of the cultural center to the left of the century, you can see one, two, and there's another one that you can't see, three arrays of um, Dow Powerhouse solar shingles. These are a really cool product. They are um, integrated solar panels and roof shingles. Those don't sit on top of a shingle. They don't project above a shingle. They are, in fact, the shingles. The roofers come, they nail them down, and it's that very thing that keeps the water out, and it's also that very thing that produces electricity from the water. We don't know yet, because we just flipped a switch the other day, but we're anticipating that this will reduce our consumption from the grid by about a third, and um, we'll save our parish a significant chunk of operating money as well. So we're very grateful for that. Um, we were able to buy all kinds of appliances. Our dishwasher uses like half the water a normal dishwasher uses. Our toilets use half the water normal toilets use. Our refrigerators are all, you know, the highest rating as far as um, energy efficiency goes. I don't want to bore you with a list of things we bought or things that were donated or things that we were able to acquire for the church. My point is, is that from, in order to do anything in terms of building a green parish, we had to have that intention from the beginning and we had to make deliberate choices all the way along. You know, the market follows the path of least resistance.